next item continues the Italian connection, but this is from an earlier period in the country's history, a period 80 years ago when Rome still maintained colonial ambitions in East Africa. In 1937, during the Italian occupation of Ethiopia, Italian forces launched a campaign of killing and repression across the country in which thousands of Ethiopians were murdered. Alex Last has been speaking to an Ethiopian who witnessed those dreadful days. The massacre went only not in Addis, but all over the country, wherever the Italians were. Over 30,000 people died on that day. The first wave, it was wild. Then later it became systematic. The seeds of this crime were sown two years earlier. In 1935, the Italian fascist dictator Benito Mussolini launched an invasion of Ethiopia, then called Abyssinia, as he desperately sought to expand Italy's overseas empire. Mussolini had amassed a huge army. It had tanks, aircraft, and they even used chemical weapons. No power on earth now seems able to hold up Italy's sweeping advance across Abyssinia's rain-swept mountains. So perhaps it's only a question of time as to when the victorious Italian troops will march into the capital and the emperor will have to sue for peace. Abandoned by the West, by 1936, the Ethiopian emperor, Haile Selassie, had fled into exile as the capital, Addis Ababa, was swamped by invading Italian forces. The atmosphere, of course, it was a new occupation. People were confused. In between the withdrawal and the Italian arrival, there had been a lot of looting, Hotels were burnt. You know, we didn't know what was going on. 93-year-old Ambassador Imru Zaleke was then just 12 years old. He came from a high-ranking Ethiopian family in Addis Ababa. His father had once been Ethiopia's minister to the League of Nations, but he had died shortly after the invasion. Their property had been commandeered by the Italian paramilitary police, the Carabinieri, but the family were allowed to live in a house in the compound. There were about 400,000 or so Italians spread all over the country. And in Addis, of course, there was a large occupation force, maybe 30,000, 40,000. I mean, there were not enough buildings for them to occupy. They were living in camps. They had just big tents, military tents, in which they stayed. And in Addis, it has begun to be segregated. We could not go to a movie, a restaurant, or shops, nothing. You are not allowed to. Mussolini placed Marshal Rodolfo Graziani in charge of Abyssinia. Graziani was a committed fascist who was already infamous for his brutality towards the population of Italy's colony in Libya. In his new post in Ethiopia, he was suspicious of the local people too, and although some Ethiopians worked with the Italians, there was resistance. Already there was uh, some patriots started a resistance. We used to hear about it through the grapevine that people were trying to buy arms and supplying it to the patriots in the country. In 1937, while Graziani and the Italian high command were attending a ceremony in Addis Ababa, two men threw grenades at the dignitaries. No Italians were killed but Graziani himself was among the wounded. You know, some people had gone to the palace because that's where Graziani had called some people. I didn't go. There were no schools or anything. So I was home, and suddenly we started hearing shooting. Almost immediately, the Italians began an orgy of killing. They first opened fire on the crowd who'd gathered at the ceremony. Then the call went out for Italians, both military and civilian, to murder as many Ethiopians as they could, wherever they could find them, with whatever weapon they had to hand. Not just guns and knives, but spades, pickaxes and sticks. Our house is around Menelik Square. It was a one-storey house, so I went up and I could see the piazza, the square, Menelik Square, and there people were running, Italians were shooting people, killing people. It was a massacre. I mean, I, from what I saw, Italians were beating them with all sorts of things, even the forks, the pails and pigs to hit, to kill people. For three days and nights, the killings continued in Addis Ababa and across the country. The worst one were the Polizia Coloniale, what they call the colonial police, the fascista. 
They were the most violent ones. Uh, but they were civilians. Uh, many of them were the workers brought to build the roads and so forth. Then they were given authority to, to kill anybody they can. And it went completely wild, which was frightening in my, in my own eyes. Uh, I didn't last long. I stayed there maybe about 10 minutes when I saw this. I ran downstairs and told my mother that uh, going on. Well, she prayed or something, but what could you do, you know? The Italians' brutality was extreme. Thousands of Ethiopian men, women and children were butchered, beaten to death or burned alive. Much of the country's intelligentsia was also targeted and wiped out. Some estimate that up to 30,000 Ethiopians were killed. I think it is a state of mind, you know, because... Uh, with all this fascist uh, propaganda, how we, they were superior, uh, white race and all that, you know, it was a, a phobia already, you know. But even after the initial wave of killings had subsided, the repression continued and thousands were arrested. The Italian came in and they took us. To, we were shocked and they put us in this uh, cellar. The next day they took us, they put us on a truck and they transported us to south of Addis, they had created a big, large compound, and they were bringing prisoners there from all over the country uh, indiscriminately. Some of them, they were ordinary peasants even. They didn't even know what was going on. It was unbelievable, and there was no place to sleep. There was uh, nothing. They were then transported to one of the regime's notorious concentration camps 800 miles away in the sweltering scrubland to the south of Mogadishu, in Italian Somaliland. We were put into trucks. It took us about two weeks to get down to Mogadishu and to this prison camp, which was walled. They gave each person a straw mat, and that was it. Very hot and humid, but the grown-ups, the men, they took them out every day to go work on roads and some constructions they had. First they gave us what they called a galleta, dried bread, and by the time the, it got to us, it was completely rotten and full of worms and everything. <laughs> That's what they gave us. <laughs> and the water we were drinking, because it was near the sea, it is salted. So people drank this salted water, more or less. People were getting sick. We had 60, 70 people dying a day. Uh, and uh, there was no way. You just throw them in the sand somewhere. Where there was no burial or anything. We just... People just, just simply collapsed and uh, people were dying all over the place. I, I almost died because I got very bad a case of uh, diarrhea. Some went uh, mad, they just cracked up. There were 6,300 people in that camp. About 3,000 of them died there. After almost two years in the camp, Imru and his family were allowed to return to Addis Ababa. Just a few years later, during World War II, the Italians were defeated in East Africa by a British imperial army and Haile Selassie was restored to the throne. The British had evacuated most of the Italian occupiers. Still, the emperor insisted there was no retaliation, though post-war the victorious powers decided not to prosecute the Italians for war crimes in Ethiopia. But, says Imru, the massacre and the brutality of the Italians did help galvanize a new sense of Ethiopian identity and nationalism. It was a catalyst for the resistance. Tremendous patriotic feeling and tremendous dedication for the country. It really, you could say, crystallized nationalism in the country amongst tribes in which we built in the country after the occupation. Ambassador Imru Zelaki was speaking to Alex Last, what a price to have to pay to build a sense of national identity. There's a photo of the Italian troops arriving in Addis Ababa in 1935 on our website. Search as ever for BBC Witness.